Hey everyone, welcome to another end of the month sync call of the program. We have the same four items on the agenda as last time. We kind of try to revisit them every time to retain the stable structure, so to say. We start, we'll start with things that you think that went well this month. Kind of like an open floor. You don't need to raise your hand. Just go ahead and express what you think. And just like for the for the whole schedule, just so everybody has the context, it's uh, what went well, what can be better. Um, talking about how we can change the reward structure in order to like incorporate what could be better, and then um, I guess editor contributions. That would be just the the quality as a whole, Anton. Yeah, so we have a few of the discussions around the minimal ed editor requirements. So right now they're set to just three comments, right? Either the summaries or interactions with other users. And basically curious to hear what everyone thinks uh, sh we should focus on moving forward and things of that nature. But yeah. So I guess to get started, uh, yeah, curious what everybody thought went well this month compared to other months that we should try and focus on. Well, for me, it was uh, just a lot more touch points with a lot of different like hubs and people, um, just a lot more activity. I think maybe stemming from the meaningful contributions, um, like minimum requirement from the editors, I was just able to interact with a lot more people across many more hubs. Yeah, totally. I say We've gotten feedback too from like uh, people on our team that uh, like just passive observers of research hubs think that the quality of conversation is way higher. That like it, it looks a lot more alive and like generally when you're on the homepage, there's like you know pretty interesting like comments that are in the live feed that can draw people in. So totally agree that like this this new reward structure that you came up with, Anton, it's done a great job of like actually getting people to sort of like uh, create you know novel content that's interesting when new people show up to a research hub. Has anyone experienced uh, interacting with users outside of the editor program in a consistent manner? I think that is probably what is lacking. Like I totally like second that the the the, the basically the the say the the level of the conversation. Like I don't want to say skyrocketed, but like it was definitely definitely better this month with other editors. Um, yeah, what is lacking is probably getting some, uh, some you know, some conversation going with uh, other people. But I, I guess that could uh, come at a later stage when maybe there's also going to be more editors. Because if we can form a really solid block of editors that interact on the platform, that is probably going to attract also other comments. I think. Yeah. So, so one comment here, which I think is important, there's this sort of like a cliche metric when looking at social apps that say like, you'll start to have organic growth once you have uh, 500 weekly active contributors who are like on the website, like making content regularly, then it becomes like an, like a place that feels active to new, like potential users who show up, who like want to like participate. And so we're hovering around like 100 weekly active users, like between 70 to 100 back and forth. And um, I think it's very reasonable to think that um, like once the like we can maybe get the token like listed or something like that and the market cap increases, we'd be able to scale the editor program to that like 500 user level where we can in theory like kind of like um, bootstrap like the initial traction which then in theory you know according to like other people's experiences building social apps starts to attract like organic users a lot easier so i think the editor program is really promising in that like everyone's pretty excited about it and like as you know the project grows and the market cap grows we'll be able to like scale it linearly with the market cap and i think that could easily be like 200 to 500 editors within the next like six to 12 months Um, as far as things that have gone well, I, I liked the uh, I like the tipping feature that was added, I guess, maybe a month or a half ago. Um, I think it's nice because I think with upvoting, um, we didn't know who was upvoting us. And I think kind of building that social connection, because when you do the tipping, you know exactly who, you know, did that. And it kind of just builds this trust and this relationship between, you know, the person who maybe wrote the comment and the person tipping. And, and I think that, um, it's what the kind of thing that keeps coming, 
keeps people coming back is that sense of social connection to someone. So um, I've, I've liked that feature a lot. That's like a really interesting point where an upvote is anonymous, but like if you go on like Twitter or like Facebook, like every like and retweet, you know, is not anonymous. Um, so it, we could do something where like uh, we could build in like a list of who upvoted what, because there is like a big difference if it's like, oh, Neil deGrasse Tyson upvoted you versus like some random person, you're like you get excited about that in theory. So that is interesting. Do you guys think that's something that we should try and look into is like more of that, like almost like an endorsement type of thing where a user's like identity is tied to their upvote? I like the idea of knowing um, who's upvoting what. And I think at least having the option that people could opt in. So if they upvote or downvote something, then you know, like when you, when you want to see if somebody has read your message, then you can activate or deactivate. So you don't see other people have, having read your message and you can't, re, you can't have that feature for yourself. I think that that option would be great. So people can decide. Otherwise, you can have also this social inhibition that people would not downvote a crappy comment because, you know, they would be exposed uh, to it. But also you could just have this kind of, I don't know, a dashboard where you can see like the comments or the papers that you have uploaded, uh, uploaded um, have have been whatever endorsed or upvoted by by this group of people, and then you kind of as as Jennifer you mentioned like to create these social connections with with people, editors or or the or, or the members of the public. I think. Yeah, I like that idea a lot. I, I even think there's a way where we could do something where like an anonymous upvote is worth less than like an upvote that you tie your identity to. Um, I, I think there's something pretty cool there because because even like I think long term in the home feed, it would be great if it's like I could see Neil deGrasse Tyson liked this post, you know, and help to like have the content be fed to me from like the scientists that I think are coolest and like what do they think is cool. So yeah, that's that's a really good idea, Jennifer. Um, I'll mention that to our engineers because it does it makes it feel more like you know personal interactiony. Ricardo, uh, how do you feel about having a sort of like a scale? Let's say like the the upvote is like completely anonymous, even like upvote and downvote completely anonymous. Then you have a sort of like recommendation, same as you have in on ResearchGate. That is not, that is like, there's your name there, but you can only recommend something. You cannot really like downvote it. And then there's the the, the final step that is basically <clears throat> the tipping where you add some monetary kind of like reward to someone. So it, it creates a sort of like scale of how much you like the paper or like the content that someone provided. Yeah, I like that too. It's like with your identity tied to it, you're spending social capital and then you're spending like uh you know financial capital with the tipping that's that's a cool scale i like that a lot i think there's totally something here with adding like social capital to upvoting and yeah i'll, I'll mention it to the team because i think it's definitely worth exploring i wonder um, I if think... there could be go ahead Jennifer. oh uh i think currently with the the tipping i don't think that other people can see who tipped who um like you can't you just see how much tip they've gotten but you don't It'd be nice if you can kind of hover over it and see kind of like who tips them because it does add to that sort of like reputation and um, that sort of thing. Yeah, so, I've been I've been thinking about something like that. So it could be implemented through the optional message uh, to the tipping. So something short that would kind of generate a comment for you. So let's say you you donate fifty RC to someone and you say just you know great great idea or something like that, right? So that's something. That's maybe too small to warrant a comment, and it would be displayed underneath a comment or a paper, but maybe in a in a visually distinct way, so that it's not fully a comment, but more like a history of messages and with the monetary value attached to them. Oh, it, it kind of reminds me. Kobe a while ago uh, wanted to bring in uh, emojis or like some kind of like reactions, so we could do something where like. You have different reactions based on like tipping, you know. So it's so it's almost like a clap rather than having to like post good job. Like there could be like a clap or something, and then yeah, that it is building in 
like more like uh, I guess like a full feature set around tipping is important because that's pretty much why Research Hub is you know in theory better than ResearchGate is like this economy portion of it. So I think you guys are right that the the like token like person to person transfers can be more robust and we could make it like feel cooler um, and like bring positive emotions with tipping. I guess, does anybody have any other suggestions of like uh, things that they thought went particularly well uh, during this last month? I, I have a couple to finish up with at the end. Safik? Uh, yeah, I think that our collab with, the collab meeting with, I think, RS, FC, uh, that was great. Uh, it could have been better if we were better informed of what they do and uh, basically what's the relevance of this meeting, but still, I think, uh collabing with other DSI projects would help sort of intermingle both of our communities and be very beneficial for both these projects uh in the future totally so, so you like when we had the the scurf folks onto the community call and we did the yeah. share peer review call yeah and then later on when you went to that college yeah, that, that was fun joining their community call too yeah. um yeah. We, we can totally do more of that like everybody in DSI is like trying to help each other out e even though it was funny um i got an email uh from uh, a director of uh product at academia.edu over the weekend basically like um criticizing how we're communicating like our tokenomics because we're definitely not doing a good job of like getting some of our internal information out public facing like a lot of it even happens during these calls and so it's like people who are not totally plugged into the slack in the community i think have like not as you know clear of a picture of how research hub is structured and so yeah this is a person from academia.edu who in theory like you know should be a competitor but uh basically hit me up and was like hey here's some helpful feedback you know like like some actually good solid like critical feedback that's like you guys need to get better at like making public information so i, I think this person would be happy to do a shared community call i think like a lot of the other projects in the space we could start to do some cross pollination so yeah we can totally prioritize that and if you have any suggestions let me know um and like happy to try and coordinate something hey patrick i know this has already been said but i think the uh like the summaries of papers are super useful i've noticed like some of the comments it's easy to have like a low quality comment like oh like i thought this article is interesting what do you guys think or just like a question that's like not really like super relevant to what the paper is actually about but i think it's just super helpful to have someone who knows who actually knew and read the paper just like a couple of sentences i think that's like one of the coolest new features in my opinion yeah i agree i think i think uh thanks to anton's new reward scheme i think there's definitely been um a lot more like like solid summaries of papers where you don't actually have to read the paper you just read a comment um and then we should come back to how we can get more people to do that in the future because i think it's like maybe 30 percent of the editors are really taking this like pretty seriously and like if we could push that to like 70 percent i think it'd be amazing um yeah um this is kind of a, a suggestion for features sort of totally um so it, just just bear with me it might come come across as weird but so like generally one of the problems that i i've, I've been thinking a lot about is the, the the volume of information right so you like under each comment i think it becomes exponential if, if there is an interesting paper and then a bunch of the editors engage in, in, in those conversations, it just balloons out in, in, into some like a large piece of text to to read and then to keep track of and then remember who said what and then try to engage with that conversation. Oftentimes you just take one of the comments and you interact with one. So I think there are these new kind of data models and, and these ways of summarizing a tech a piece of text into like their absolute bare minimum structure that communicates the the message of him of, of, of a of a comment a piece of text or a paragraph what have you and i was wondering whether this could be implemented there, there are all these free libraries that you could use in order to kind of shorten a longer uh, longer uh, sort of comment into something which is more digestible I don't know if kind of this is this these are the questions that I usually try to to think a lot about uh, in my in my days and I was wondering whether this could be implemented somehow 
that uh, of course you would still have access to the whole um, kind of thread of comments and the back and forth, but also in a way to kind of be able to engage with that with the thread in its totality, as as opposed to just reading every piece, which in some cases it is necessary to read every piece of comment to get the context and what is it that the texture of the conversation. But sometimes you could kind of you know, collapse some of those comments into smaller, like a sentence or two sentences, and then say like, okay, this is what I have to interact with. So, so just to repeat it back to make sure that I've kind of like caught like the feature that you're suggesting, you're thinking like some kind of like ML tool that would automatically summarize comments um, and spit out kind of like a TLDR for exactly. long term. Right. And also because that the nature of the comments are, uh, is that, that they're going to be short, so they're not going to be large text and kind of getting the context and being able to summarize smaller pieces of text is, is actually pretty, um, pretty doable. Yeah, I, I would love to catch up later if you have like examples of this working in practice where like the fidelity is like, you know, 95 plus percent um, when we've done machine learning stuff in the past. It will be cool, but there will it'll be like an 80-20 type of solution. We don't have any like machine learning specific engineers, and we think we're too early stage for it at the moment. Um, so so there will be like cool outcomes, but it just doesn't work perfectly all of the time. Um, but yeah, what you're describing, like my brain automatically turns off when I see a long paragraph of text if it's not like two sentences space, two sentences space. And so if we could lean into that and like help, you know, scientists communicate better. Like, that'd be pretty cool. Like, if you didn't have to get good at SciComm and there was a website that just translated for you, that, I mean, that would be very cool. Um, yeah, so let's catch up later about it. I think that may be, like, a year down the road, but we're, we're thinking about, like, how we can use ML tools to basically, like, summarize lots of different things, including papers themselves. Um, so uh, yeah, yes, sir. I, as far as I could understand your idea, I really liked it, I think. I feel the same that my brain immediately skips an entire wall of text. Like, uh, so on that topic, I get that something that uh, that generates an automatic and like good TLDR would be uh, would take up a lot of time. But uh, could there maybe be something preliminary to that that could uh, maybe edit it better, like automatically generate a better edited version of it where it's like as you mentioned two lines space and then two lines space that could help improve readability in the meantime it's definitely possible i know there's a lot of exciting stuff uh that machine learning engineers are doing and, and even like a lot of the back-end engineers that we're interviewing at the moment like i think their passions really lie in machine learning because there's so much cool stuff that you can do so at, at the moment i think we're a little premature to do like some of these kind of like um polishing types of features like we still need to figure out the feature set that's going to give us product market fit um which may be 500 editors potentially but um i think like once we start to see that growth we're going to build out our team pretty significantly and that will probably include a couple ml engineers um just an example one tool i really like is scholar this has been around for a year or two and these guys like they generate um bullet point summaries of papers and we wanted to integrate this into Research Hub. We were doing it for a while. We had these like uh, uh, key takeaway features where there would be bullet points automatically generated for every paper from ScholarC. And I thought this was amazing. Like when I was posting papers, I would use ScholarC just to like save the time for me when reading it because it would just I would understand it in ten minutes rather than like half an hour. Um, but even ScholarC, when we plugged it into Research Hub and had things automatically generated, it would work for like. Yeah, like 80% of the papers and then the other ones, it would be like pretty bad. So yeah, it's, I, I know Brian specifically, um, he has low tolerance for stuff that doesn't look good. And so like, it needs to be working probably like 95% before we can feel comfortable, like having uh, machine learning tools, like integrated automatically. Yeah, I totally agree. Maybe I'm just like cynical about these like statistical learning models, but like I've never in my entire life seen a, AI ML summary that I thought was even remotely good. They're all like, I think they're all shit. <laughs> and then also it introduces more just like philosophical issues where it's like, if we're going to use these tools to like, I don't know, it's like kind of like, like, 
I feel like it's antithetical to the idea of research hub where it's like, let's create a community where we actually read the science and understand the science and talk about the science. And I feel like this is like a cheap trick, a cheap shortcut that I don't like, don't think it's worth it, but I could be wrong. I, I think it's, it, it's just early. Like it, it could be cool probably during the lifespan of research hub at some point, but yeah, right now it's, I think it's just early. Um, but yeah, I, I hate doing work. So if a computer could do the work for me, I would not hate that at all. Um, uh, Jennifer? Uh, where I think um, the machine learning could be really useful is in recommendations. Like if someone's really liked the paper then and has kind of engaged with the paper, like having this automatic feature that kind of recommends something else you might be interested in, um, that's where I can see the machine learning portion being really useful. Like something that can parse the different uh, papers and know that certain ones are related or comparable. Totally. Yeah. And even like not to get on a machine learning rabbit hole, because we could talk about a lot of cool features, I think. But um, I think it'd be great. Like eventually we plan to have expertise weighted upvoting. So like everyone, you know, has like a skill rating in each hub and then like your skill rating influences how much your upvote is weighted. And I think we could use machine learning to essentially like say every paper, this paper is like 15% biochemistry, 75% public health, you know, and and have like a really dynamic like uh, expertise weighting system uh, using machine learning to categorize each paper. But yeah, I, I think th these are all ideas that are probably like a year in the future from now. Um, but yeah, I guess bringing things back to the uh, agenda, um, unless anybody else has anything particularly uh, positive, I, I have one thing that I'd like to round it out with, but anybody else before we move on? I, I Just a quick, a little bit something too. I think the whole idea of, hey, we have this task that we would like to delegate to machine learning and could be twisted in a different way and could be, hey, this means that there is a semi-routine task that we could potentially convert into bounties, right? And think about it this way. Okay. We need more meaningful ways to distribute REC to people who care and who would like to do work, right? So that, that could be an easy so, uh, goal for this here, I guess, right? So think about it this way. What if you could post a bounty to a common thread to summarize the, 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 the outcome of the thread? So it's like a holy war of 30, 300 comments. What's the outcome, right? What's the take home? And so perhaps someone who was part of this conversation or who read it and understood it could, you know, claim this bounty if they could write kind of like a meta comment. Uh, is there is it structured as a separate comment? Then we don't need any engineering effort or it could be maybe placed like on top if it's uh, approved by the editor of the with a hub or something like that. And the same with just the 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 summaries and the take homes. We could not replace the editors and their summaries with the machine learning, but maybe assist them, right? So if we have a certain uh, structure in mind that we think is works best, then perhaps we could uh, kind of like not, not force them, but maybe develop a, a template with fields that they just need to fill, right? So instead of them, instead of us delegating the formatting and everything to the editors, we could be like, okay, just here is the field for the main finding number one. Here is the field for your opinion. Here is the field for unanswered question or something like this, right? And then it would just spit it out to a research hub page in, in the format that we think works best and not is not intimidating and stuff like that. Yeah, totally. And I love that idea because really, like, how do you get better ML models? You have better data that you input in them. And so, like, we have humans, you know, creating this data, like, over the course of, you know, a decade, you know, we could eventually have something pretty cool at the end if we have, like, specific bounties for people to create data that we can eventually use to train uh, machine learning models. Um, but, yeah, so, th so that leads me to, to my thing that I'm most excited about, I think, from this last month is it seems like um, like a, a certain portion of the community is engaging more and is trying to do more stuff like outside of just the forum. So like uh, setting up the DWORK bounties to be able to like post on social media, posting about our Gitcoin grant. Um, th that to me is super exciting because I think there's like a bunch of different ways that we could bring bounties into Research Hub, um, even as like MVPs of new features. 
Um, and having that infrastructure set up, I think is very exciting and that people are engaging with it is pretty cool. So I guess um, the most important thing that we can talk about is uh, what you all think is not going well and can be improved uh, for the next month. I think um, something that uh, I talked a little bit with Nick Oldberg about was um, kind of like having maybe more like either realistic like timelines that are verbalized to the community or maybe even like and I know some other projects I'm involved with don't even mention timelines at all you know because I think when like um, if you mention like oh something's going to be a week out and then it's more than a week out then the community gets a little antsy about it and so um, maybe sticking to like generic phrases such as like this will be kind of in the short term or medium term and that way you don't get fixed into a timeline and then you know, well what's going on where's this um, I think that as like one point and then the second point is um, and I think similar to last month was just like maybe allocating like a week of like fixing bugs um, and making sure that like at least the base fundamental things of the platform are working like top notch before trying to layer on like new features. Um, I think I think those two points probably. Yeah, th thank you, Jeff. That's super helpful. I, I, in general, think our communication is not ideal at the moment, and it's something that we kind of need to uh, figure out how to get better on. Um, so I totally agree with you in that, like, uh, communicating, like, when new features or, like, community stuff is going to happen. Um, yeah, I guess being more accurate by uh, not giving specific timelines. W one thing that I've noticed, like, and this is just from uh, – trying to build like tech products for a couple of years now is like there's always an estimate and then it takes twice as long mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah it's like to a certain degree like our engineers are working hard and like th this is what they think it'll take but then like you know bugs pop up they have to fix them there, there's always more stuff so yeah the the getting the timelines down I, yeah i've noticed it always just takes i i can bake that into my communication. Like I'll, I'll, when I, I'll take their information, try and, you know, take that into account when I communicate it. Multi multiply it by the, uh, the tech coefficient, uh, <laughs> which is like two to three X. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, it's a great point though. We should definitely be, uh, yeah, I think better communicators just in general, e even with this academia.edu that's, uh, it's becoming you know, pretty apparent. Um, so thank you, uh, Nick. Oh, yeah, I just want to chime in completely agree, of course. Um, I think it, it'd be a, like kind of a simple change. I mean, just changing phrasing from it will be to, you know, we estimate this long or we're aiming for this or something just to kind of keep it a little bit in that gray area, if it is, um, would help kind of, I think, keep people sort of having full trust in those updates instead of being like, well, last time, I don't know about, you know, it, it would get it, if we know it's indefinite, then it's easier for it to be such, I think, going forward. Totally, yeah, it makes perfect sense. Just setting like the proper expectations. That, that's actually really, really helpful feedback. So thank you for saying that. Jennifer? Um, I guess as far as, I guess, bug issues, um, one of the things I think I, I brought up in the community meeting was that um, the author, the pulling the author data is not working so much for at least the journal that I use the most, which is IEEE. Um, and I think uh, since the plan is to eventually kind of um, automatically assign some RFC to authors, I think that's something that we probably <laughs> need to get uh, working. Um, and so that's just something. And uh, the other kind of bug that I've been experiencing, I don't know if um, anyone else has had this issue, but like for the notifications, when you click on, like you have five different notifications, when you click on one to try to take you to the thread that that notification is alerting you to it it doesn't take me there like it doesn't work so um just as far as like those annoying little things um that sort of hamper engagement a little bit when things don't work yeah totally uh thanks for mentioning the notification bug i hadn't seen that one yet but i'll put in a ticket and send it to the engineers um regarding like the the bug uh sprint kind of like fixing bugs i think it's like once every six weeks um we'll spend or i guess once every eight weeks we'll spend two weeks uh fixing bugs 
So I think that should be coming up either this next sprint or the one after that. Um, I, I've like mentioned to Brian a couple times that like there are some pretty decent bugs, like even like the withdrawing of RSC, it makes me semi nervous. Like if a bunch of people come in and want to withdraw RSC, if it's not working properly, like I think that's going to make my life not ideal. Um, but in general, I think Brian's still in this mode of like, it's more important to try new features to see like what actually hits. Um, and I think we're starting to transition towards like feeling like we kind of have product market fit here and like making the feature set more robust. Like we're, we're in the like 10% into that transition. But I know the last time I brought up like some of the bugs that were making me feel uncomfortable, sort of the ethos that I got in return was we're still a small team. We're still experimenting. Like there's, you know, it's just part of it until we find the recipe and then you can reinforce all of the things like to, to make sure it works perfectly. So that yeah, I guess uh, with that being said, like we very much appreciate you guys like kind of like dealing <laughs> with that because it, it kind of sucks. And I think if it ever gets to the point where you're like, I wouldn't want to use this thing anymore, let me know. So that way I can communicate that to Brian. So that way it can be like higher up on his priority list of like what we need to spend engineering time doing, if that makes sense. I think um, it doesn't so much like detract me from doing to using the website, but I think it might uh, make it harder for me to recommend it to others. Mm. <laughs> if it's not working well, then I feel like, oh, now I have to tell them all the you know bugs that they have to kind of navigate through, um, that sort of thing. Yep, I will pass that along because that is that's part of it. Like if you get organic referrals, so I will definitely let the team know that you feel that way. That is actually incredibly helpful. So thank you for saying that. Um, Safik? Uh, yeah, so it might be too early for this, but I think we are experiencing some sort of community churn wherein people who are uh, either incentivized, such as I think Scott has been, or who aren't incentivized, they uh, they join uh, RS, they are pretty excited in the start, but then eventually it settles down. Right? Uh, so that might be something that possibly even the editors could look into, or, or maybe I think uh, uh, Lynn was made uh, head of editors, so maybe she could be given better uh, directions from the core team uh, on how to prevent this sort of churn from happening. Because at this stage, uh, retaining everyone we could is should be very high priority for us. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone else uh, shares this concern. Uh, and again, might be too early. So I, I think your internet connection was breaking up a little bit. I couldn't hear everything, but just to repeat back, what I think I heard was like addressing churn, essentially. Like people, you know, come to the community, they're excited, and then like you have to have low churn in theory in order to like actually have growth. Um, so that way you right. keep the people who who come in. So. Um, yeah, I guess it, it it's interesting you, you feel that way because we've actually had zero churn in the editor program. Like no one has left. Um, we've had to like, I think, um, like take a couple people out for low activity, um, but even those people didn't want to leave. Um, so yeah, I guess like, could you dive into a little bit more detail of like what, what you're perceiving uh, as that churn? Maybe we can like help to like get people more engaged. Yeah, uh, so I think, uh, I don't think Scott, if you might remember Scott from the technology hub, uh, I think they were pretty excited and they had set up a Twitter, but uh, I can't find the Twitter anymore. Uh, and I haven't seen much activity or like joining the community calls from them. Right? And the same I have seen from people who were, uh, who weren't incentivized to join the community and they had sort of, uh, they were interested in buying RSC with their own money, right? So uh, they didn't really receive uh, much enthusiasm from the editors who might be looking to buy. Uh, I think it was Jazz Star on Slack who's interested. Right? Uh, so they didn't receive any enthusiasm. Plus, I think some of their uh, comments might also uh, have gone on. Right? Uh, and again, uh, we're extremely small at this point. so. Even these individual cases 
get very highlighted right so this might be just paranoia or uh, sort of over analyzing it right? uh, so let me know if that's what i'm doing. and i hear what you're saying too you're referring to like engagement outside of the research hub app not necessarily like our metrics that track like people's engagement within right. the yeah. itself. okay that makes look perfect. at slack or people doing things outside of it such as to prove their own. Totally. So, so um, yeah, I actually kind of agree with you in that I, I think we have a lot of like uh, energy that isn't being properly harnessed. Like, uh, I think we need to set up some infrastructure to help direct people who like want to help, like how to do that and make sure that they're adequately compensated for doing so. Um, I, I know the community leads are putting together kind of like a, a structure of working groups. So that way there will be like a, a little bit more of like a like a reception area, you know, for lack of a better term, for people who want to get started like doing social media stuff or hosting events, like there will be a place they can go in order to like see all the other people who are interested with that and like ask questions. And there will be like, you know, some representatives there who can help like point people in the right direction. Um, so yeah, I actually expect this to, to pick up um, within the next month. And it, it, it was almost like the like the one thing I was most excited about was the D work where I think like we'll, we are putting that infrastructure in place now to help to like, you know, adequately harness some of the excitement people have and like get them into like repeatable patterns of behavior where like they're helping to grow a research hub. Um, Cause even the Twitter stuff, I think like we need some organization to it. Like, uh, yeah, having, having like somebody who knows what they're doing, helping to point people in the right direction would be very helpful. Um, so like, there's, um, so there's like uh, people have mentioned uh, using PO apps um, for like rewarding people. They're kind of like little badges um, when you come to community calls or certain calls. Um, and so they're kind of just like a badge of attendance that you were there at that you know event. Um, and like some other projects have like incentivized or rewarded people with X amount of PO apps, for example. Um, so I think for the like community call, that's great. We actually, me, Ricardo and Aridia have a, a meeting later today to like finish setting up the working groups. Uh, we're gonna be using Discord for it. Um, Discord integrates really perfectly with Dwork. So it'll be great to have the working groups there. And then the bounties to reward people in the working groups well integrated. Uh, to just want to get maybe like a little feedback from people. Do you guys think it's, are you guys okay with using Discord? Do you prefer to set up working groups on Slack instead and keep it all in one location? Do you guys have any input about that? I think Slack is a uh, better UX overall because all of my work on Research Hub is already on Slack. Right? Okay. So I think that would that would translate very easily. But yeah, of course, Discord work Discord might work better with DWorks. Yeah. The thing with Discord, and I hear you too, Jennifer. Um, Discord can get kind of like messy. Um, the only thing is like Discord is really well structured with like roles. We can really like organize people into set roles and have nice like privacy filters and things like that on certain things. Um, so uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll come back in another time and maybe maybe chat with some folks to see what you would prefer. Uh, also, Jeffrey, on your point, uh, not really a big fan of giving badges uh, for community attendance, right? right? Because I think what's more important is that uh, as Patrick said that the energy that they're already bringing in is provided sort of better channel. Uh, I'm not really sure if badges would be that uh, useful, at least at this stage, when RSC doesn't hold any utility. I, sorry, Satvik, I couldn't hear like 50% per of that. There's a lot of background noise. I'll just text you. Later on. OK, sounds good. Yeah, I think we might be getting in a little bit of the weeds too. I think the idea is that like there's excitement and we need to do a better job of capturing it. And we have some plans in the works to hopefully like experiment on how we can do that. Um, Ricardo? Yeah, just just to second what uh, Selvik said, uh, I think there's a, definitely a portion of people that are excited and we can get them definitely to work with uh, like uh, working groups and so on. But do you feel, and like this is a question for you all, like how many editors should actually also like be socially active? Because like if we like, I can I can 
basically say, let's say 10, 15 people are actually like pretty active out of like 60 editors. Should there be more? Is there a number? Like, should we actually like ask editors to be more present or is that just kind of scale up with the number of editors? Like, what do you think about that? Is honestly, I think there should be a little bit more participation, but at the same time, apart from pro-ops, I don't know how, how we could incentivize that. Uh, but that shouldn't be forced. Like people shouldn't really be forced to, to do that. Should actually just try it out. Because when you try it out, maybe you like it. You go to one community call, you go to the other, and it's like, yeah, this is pretty cool. I can actually, you know, um, get some feedback or whatever. So yeah, just wanted to get your opinion on this. So, so I guess my overall thoughts are that like, um, and this is not the best analogy, but like with social media apps in general, it's something like 1% of everybody who shows up is actually like a weekly active contributor. And then of that 1%, 99% just upvote. Like if you're looking at Reddit or Stack Overflow or something like that. And so 1% are actually like 1% of the 1% are creating content. And so now we're, we're even going a step further of like social engagement around a project. So to me, I think like, 15 to 20% is like pretty good. Like that, that is actually like very inspiring to me that like, you know, like everybody in this room is like a, a super bright person and like cares and wants this project to succeed and is like doing extra to make it happen. Um, so, so I feel, and without a benchmark, I feel like it's pretty good, the engagement that we have. And we've actually gotten compliments that the engagement is like pretty good. Um, with that being said though, I think it's important to set a culture of like, hey, if you want to be in this seat, you know, like we we need everybody to contribute, like to maximize our chances of success. And so there are ways that we can help to like do this. Um, there's a concept of like like talent density um, from like the uh, Reed Hastings. Uh, I guess that's not the Netflix guy, but the Netflix book. Um, and so we could like. You know in theory like um move on from editors who are not contributing like in like uh, additional capacities i'm not sure if that's the best way to go about it but um we could also do things like where like maybe the editor rewards are like fifteen hundred dollars worth but if you have the four po apps you know you can get like an, an additional fifteen hundred or something like that um where you know payments are sort of contingent on like some minimum degree of participation. Um, yeah, so so I guess overall, I think that I'm like actually kind of blown away by like some of the like involvement that the community's had. And I know like our, our board and Brian feels the same way. I think we should always try and do better though. And I'm definitely open to uh, trying to maximize that w without necessarily like putting out like GE style, like bad vibes where just the bottom 25% gets cut, you know, continually and it creates an environment of like not, you know, productivity. So, yeah, I, I guess this is like a decent transition point to like what should we reward for the next, um, you know, month. But before we do that, we got Nick and Anton. So, Anton? Yeah, I was just. Uh... To return to the earlier point about the uh, features, I, I've, I'm always a big proponent of like zeroing in on set of features before moving to the next one. I understand your desire for jumping and seeing which one sticks, but at the same time, I'd like to emphasize that some features that you think you have explored, you haven't, right? You have the hypothesis feature, but at the same time, I think that it's currently not in a state that people actually consider it a fully fledged feature, right? You don't know if you have the market fit for the hypothesis feature yet because it hasn't been implemented enough. And so same stuff like that. And also like just in general, moving on to other features creates this kind of like unfinished scaffoldings that will, uh, that will have a cost in the future. So for example, the pots of gold, right? And your recent change to higher um, RSC accumulation towards the offers of the paper. It's great change, but it's it's not empowered by the properly developed mechanism of assigning offers, right? It's like offers are not extracted sometimes, and it's really hard to add offers. It's really hard to verify offers. So it's like it, it kind of like leads us to the world where you need to retrospectively 
think whether you can introduce new feature or it will be broken from the get-go because of the previous features it's built on, you know? Totally. Yeah, and it's a great point. And, and I guess like what would be useful maybe is to have a call where we kind of go over our big picture roadmap and see like if everybody's like, hey, don't do peer review now. Like we're more excited about uh, the ELN. Like, we want you to spend more time on the ELN, right? Um, so yeah, let's let's schedule that then. I'll take that as an action item to push that forward because it would be cool to hear what everybody thinks um, big picture wise. Um, sorry, I'm writing that down. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I, I think it makes a lot of sense to get feedback to make sure we're not jumping from something when people could be excited about it and it's just not fully fledged all the way out. Um, with the with the pots of gold specifically, uh, this is like a, a problem in general is that like tying authors to their real identity um, is like a, it's pretty much impossible at the at the current moment. Um, the reason like academia.edu is famous for just sending like a bajillion emails to people that are not relevant whatsoever. And like it's because they have a hard time assigning like, you know, who who's this P Joyce, right? Like there's a million Patrick Joyce's out there um, and I get emails for all of them, you know, and so Academia ID is a pretty big company and they struggle with this. So I think it's, I don't know if there's a good technical solution for the authors thing right now. Um, I think what actually might be the solution here is bounties where like, like, you know, we don't want Jennifer spending her time filling in like authors, but there are people out there, you know, who we could totally leverage to help like do some of the manual labor type of work. Um, yeah, so I'm thinking there's a social solution to the authors thing. And like, I don't know if a tech, like a perfect technical one exists, like we could build it, but it would be challenging. Um, no, yeah. I, I didn't mean the technical solution, but it, 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 the social solution could be right. So you could, it's a matter of priorities, right? You could say, hey, I think before, right, because in, men, in academia, you don't claim actual real money, right, with your profile. So the cost of error is much higher in Research Hub. So I'm just, I'm like a little panicking about situation in the future where we get a huge scandal with some random dude claiming multiple accounts for, you know, esteemed offers. And I'm trying to think of ways to prevent it. So basically what I'm saying is, if in in ideal world before you implement pots of gold you impl implement the verification process maybe it's not uh machine learning or whatever base maybe it's manual base but you implement the the structure for it to happen first and then you implement the, the pots of gold in my opinion but you know philosophies differ no i i think that's actually really good feedback in that um we need to make sure that we have the ability to implement the vision for the big picture feature. Like we have to have like the the building box set in order to do that. And sometimes I think we do build stuff where it's like, we'll just figure it out as we go. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's, yeah. So we can definitely, as I kind of said before, like um, we're starting to transition to a more stable product. Like uh, we just got the order where everything that gets shipped to like the production website has to be run through a designer, which is new for us. Normally we're trying to like iterate as quickly as possible. And so now it's like a certain degree of like, there's a minimum bar of professionalism that needs to like be put out before we ship it to the website. So yeah, it, to me, that's like a good sign. Cause it seems like, you know, Brian thinks we're headed in the right direction. Um, but yeah, you're totally right that thinking the features all the way through uh, to make sure that they are implemented properly is important. And I can do a better job of communicating like how we're thinking of features. Um, so that way uh, you guys can poke holes in them to help us think about like the issues fundamentally that we need to consider before we actually start to like uh, ship something. Uh, Nick? So I just want to <clears throat> chime in first. I definitely agree with Anton as far as order of operations, you know, implementing something and having that foundation to build on. Um, and I, I understand what Brian's saying as far as trying out different features to find that product market fit. <clears throat> um, but I do think it's important to be aware of that this is a we're we're in an age of people moving really quickly and getting a quick feedback. 
um, whereas Research Hub is a site that wants more engagement, wants someone to spend a lot more time on it and digest and really deep dive into it. <clears throat> so for that, I think the the idea of a bug kind of affecting somebody's experience is much heightened on Research Hub just because in order to really use the platform, you have to give it more than you may give to other platforms too. Like on Reddit, if it glitches and it doesn't load a meme, I don't care. I'll just scroll to the next one. But you know, if I'm writing a comment and something glitches, it's it's those little um, barriers would be a lot harder because you need that avalanche of activity to really use the platform fully. So it's kind of like we're <clears throat> we're doing this on hard mode a little bit. So the the bugs could be um, could derail it more than it may for other social media sites that wouldn't demand as much from their users. It's a it's a really well put point, Nick. Um, and I will I'll communicate this because it seems like everybody here, you know, there's a consensus kind of about this perspective. So I will definitely help to like, uh, you know, let the rest of our team know that like the users are kind of feeling this way. Um, yeah, totally. So so one thing that like uh, Brian's pretty passionate about is like loading times, like basically the website's performance. And there are studies out there where like, it, you know, like if it, things load in 100 milliseconds, nobody's going to leave. But if things load in 175 milliseconds, then people start to leave. And so like, it makes perfect sense where just little performance stuff, like it's annoying and people don't want to deal with it. And so, yeah, it, it, it doesn't make sense to me that bugs wouldn't operate in the same way as like website performance does where like if something's, you know, taking too long or something breaks, you're just like, screw it. <laughs> you know, I can go do something else in my time. So yeah, I, I, I'm glad you guys are saying this cause I feel the same way too. And, and oftentimes like, you know, there's manual fixes that we needed for some of these bugs. So I'll definitely pass this along that um, everybody wants us to like focus more on making sure that like the the basic functionality of Research Hub is working properly. Uh, Ricardo? I cannot put in together uh, bugs and uh, what Yasha said about bringing authors to the platform. Is the referral program uh, working? Because uh, like the, like the guy that I referred uh, didn't get anything, so I, I was just wondering. Again, it could be a bug, or it could just be the the, the feature not working. So uh, yeah, I was wondering this because again, it's not a big deal. It's like fifty RC, but on the perspective of a new user, uh, it could be like, why is this not working? Like he's telling me that I'm I'm getting this. I'm, I mean, we both know it's not a big deal, but like still. So yeah, just so, thinking in the perspective of the the new user. Totally a big deal. If you're a new person and you're like, I didn't get this thing that I was promised, you know, that's definitely different than somebody who's been here and has like received stuff. If like that's your first interaction, yeah, that's definitely a big deal. Um, I will pass that on. And then Ricardo, if you send me who that was, I can manually send them the research coin. Um, oh, it was Douglas. Douglas, who, the, the guy, the guy we talked to during the during the call that we had. Uh yeah, that guy. And, okay. Yeah. I, I can send it a name later. Yeah, I've, I've got them in my calendar. So I'll pull them up and, and send that uh, right after this call. And then I'll ping you, Ricardo, once that's done. Oh, sorry, I'll, along the same line. Uh, also about the, the double, still another bug happened with, with him. Like uh, there's like two profiles of him on Research Hub. This is maybe something that we also want to prevent in the future, like having like double users. Because uh, if you if you search it on Research Hub, there's like two profiles. He has two two author profiles. Like yeah. His, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Thanks for mentioning that. I'll definitely have the guys go and look into kind of like the how the authors are being assigned as well. Can I can I say some something very quick? And I'm mindful that we're at the end of the hour. Like on on the point that I tried to elaborate. If, if there would be, like we discussed, no more new features, but I think this, this could be a very, very small thing that it's an addition during the process of uploading a, pa uh, a paper. You would, because when you upload a paper, you have the email address of the lead author, always. 
and you could just like have that thing automatized in a way and with a nice template and you could even offer like a, you could also personalize it and say like write it to this this individual and say like hey this is the, this is a situation uh i'm uploading this thing on on on, on um, and research hub and I can onboard you and for that I think then you could kind of create this incentive of okay I'm going to spend half an hour to onboard somebody who has published in a very good journal and has a say in a particular field um, and if it's done through the research hub I think that that could be a very nice addition to to the to the upload process I like that a lot I mean that's a, a nice any way you can get into people's inboxes like it's a good growth strategy um, what does everybody else think about something like that? Because, like my my like capitalism brain is like that's great, you know, free advertising. But then I know like I hate it when I get unsolicited emails. So generally, we've tried to stay out of people's inboxes just because, like, I don't know. I think it can be annoying, but that that's my own bias. So yeah, if you guys think it's okay, another thing I was thinking is like we could have a button with like ask the author to be here right and then maybe like once five people say that we can send an email that say like hey jeffrey corey yashar nick goldberg like these people want you here because they're interested in your paper um and i think that's a little bit more compelling than like uh you know like a yeah just having people say they want you i think it's cool i second that one patrick what you just said i think when people like researchers feel like their research is important to a group of people they'll feel a lot more inclined to participate. OK, cool. And there may be a way we could do this with even just like upvotes, like tracking who upvoted, you know, like as five upvotes come in, then we can say, hey, like these five people are interested in your paper, like come stop by and say hi, you know. Yeah, there's, th this is a great idea. I like this a lot. There's definitely something here. Okay, so we have about one minute left, and I think like um, maybe the most actionable thing that can come out of this call, aside from the bugs that I'll pass along to the team, um, for the next month's reward structure, do we want to tweak it from the three meaningful comments? I, I know we're lucky that we have Lynn now, and I think we'll do a better job of actually like communicating this to all the editors, having a person dedicated to it. Um, but what do we think about the three meaningful comments? Do we want to do another month with it? Do we want to tweak it at all? What do you all think? It's been pretty good. I've had no problems really with it. Um, I just, yeah, naturally kind of engage with the platform and I think I've, I've hit those, you know, metrics. Yeah, I think it's good. I think one improvement is like in the email that we get, like if you don't do it, I think just having a little bit more information, just because that feels like a pretty like boilerplate email. If it could be like, here's here's your one comment, good job, you need one more, just something like that, that shows that the email is not just like randomly sent to you. Yeah, totally, 100%. Because I do think that they were kind of randomly getting sent there for a little bit. So like some of their, I, I think like uh, authority was diminished because of that. So yeah that makes a lot of sense i like that that's a lot more personable cool yeah that sounds good to me um does anybody else have any final comments anton do you have do you have anything you're thinking uh no if someone thinks about different kinds of contribution moving forward feel free to reach out to me or post them in, in slack you know always open for um, more interesting suggestions, I guess. I mean, I mean, they they have been designed just because we've been thinking about how to facilitate the interactions between users, right? And the summaries are the most approachable part of an article, and then the, the response to another comment is an act of interaction. So if you can think of something that would fit nicely in that scheme and perhaps would be a little bit more open maybe to non-editors, so that, that's personally... I think is the I'm a little less optimistic about organic growth. I think we need, even if we hit 500 editors, we would still need to do some changes to open the floor a little bit more for non-editors before they'll start you know, jumping in and discussing. And so if you guys think of any ways to make it happen, please do let me know. 
I guess the one last thought I had too is kind of going back to Ricardo's comment about um, like some of the editors engaging more than others. Uh, we, we talked about this a little bit and like in theory, the editor role is to help like curate content, you know, within Research Hub and make sure each hub is like adequately taken care of. And so maybe it's another role of like engaging within the community where like, um, you know, people can be an editor and do this other role uh, or, or like not be an editor and just do this other role. So, so it's possible there's like a power user type of, uh, yeah, I guess like a place in the community where you can earn extra tokens for doing extra things, but it's not necessarily 100% a part of the editor program. Um, it's something, something we've thought about, but then I also don't like sprawl with like lots of different roles and stuff I think could get confusing. So it is just something to think about. Cool. I guess does anybody have uh, anything else before we uh, call it a day? Great. Well, thanks for everybody's time. And uh, specifically, like, thanks for the critical feedback. This is always by far the most useful. And so I think I've gotten like some pretty good context here that I'm gonna be able to communicate. So yeah, thanks for digging in and, uh, you know, for taking the time to, to share it uh, so productively too, I think is always pretty much the best thing that we can get from the community. So very much appreciate it. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, absolutely. All right, see you everybody. See you everyone, bye.